The Lord hath blessed my master greatly, and he has become great, and he hath given him flocks and herds and silver and gold and men servants and maid servants and camels and asses. And Sarah, my master's wife, bare a son to my master when she was old, and unto him hath he given all that he hath. And my master made me swear, saying, Thou shalt not take a wife to my son of the daughters of the Canaanites in whose land I dwell, but thou shalt go unto my father's house and to my kindred and take a wife unto my son. And I said unto my master, more or less, what if she won't go with me? Peradventure the woman will not follow me. And he said unto me, The Lord, before whom I walk, will send his angel with thee, and prosper thy way, and thou shalt take a wife for my son of my kindred and of my father's house. All right, those are the three passages for now from Genesis. Did you happen to notice any common denominator in those three passages? Walk, all right? Walk with God, all right? Not just walk, and that's good, it's exercise, but walking with God, all right? Enoch walked with God. Noah walked with God. And this last one told us in so many words that Abraham walked with God. What does it mean to walk in a general sense? Colton? To move? That's, that's real good. Any, anything else? Journey? Okay. Unless you're on a treadmill, maybe. <laughs> Sometimes you feel that way in life, kind of, maybe. You could just... Or maybe like the one they say, you know, the, the wheel's turning, but the hamster's dead. <laughs> you know? Okay, walk means moving, means journey. I think somebody said anything else? Moving towards something. Moving towards something, okay. These are all good. The dictionary said to advance, which would be moving. That's good, Colton. To advance or travel on foot at a moderate speed or pace, proceed by steps, move by advancing the feet alternately so that there is always one foot on the ground in bipedal locomotion. (laughs) That's not exactly how I would describe it, but that's what the dictionary said. Three things stood out to me there. If you're walking, you're advancing, you're moving, like Colton said, all right? Another one was, you proceed by steps. It's different than jumping. You're here and then you're there. It's proceeding by steps. Step by step by step. That's right. And that's the third thought. You always stay grounded, so to speak. It's not just like you're up floating around somewhere, but you stay grounded And I think we could draw a spiritual parallel there. When we walk with God, he keeps us grounded. You know, it's not just like we're up in some otherworldly state. We're still here on earth. We still have a foot on ground, so to speak. But he helps us advance one step at a time. All right, now let's notice a few more passages. uh, Micah, chapter 6. Some of you probably know some of this passage by heart. Micah chapter 6, beginning with verse 6. The next one will be in Colossians, if you're really speedy and want to put your finger in the next spot. Micah chapter 6, and then Colossians chapter 2. Micah 6, 6 says, Wherewith shall I come before the Lord? And bow myself before the high God. Shall I come before him with burnt offerings, with calves of a year old? Will the Lord be pleased with thousands of rams or with ten thousands of rivers of oil? Shall I give my firstborn for my transgression, the fruit of my body for the sin of my soul? Notice verse 8. He has showed thee, O man, what is good. And what doth the Lord require of thee? But to do justly and to love mercy, and to walk humbly with thy God. All right, Colossians chapter 2, verses 6 and 7. 
As ye have therefore received Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk ye in him, rooted and built up in him, and established in the faith, as ye have been taught, abounding therein with thanksgiving. Then, 1 Peter chapter 2. I told you there's a lot of scripture, but it can say it a lot better than I can. 1 Peter chapter 2, and then we'll be looking at 1 John chapter 2. 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 19. For this is thankworthy, if a man for conscience toward God endure grief, suffering wrongfully. For what glory is it, if when ye are buffeted for your faults, ye shall take it patiently? But if when ye do well and suffer for it, ye take it patiently, this is acceptable with God. For even hereunto were ye called, because Christ also suffered for us, leaving us an example that ye should follow his steps. Who did no sin, neither was guile found in his mouth, who when he was reviled, reviled not again. When he suffered, he threatened not, but committed himself to him that judgeth righteously. In other words, he left it in God's hands. What that, in essence, what that scripture says to me is, if you get more or less tormented and tortured, because of some unique human choices, what profit is there in that? But if you get tortured for trying to do your best to walk with God, then, then there's some worth in that. And if we follow in the steps of Christ, when he was reviled and persecuted, he left it in God's hands to deal with it. That's not always the easiest thing to do but we'll find that he can handle it a lot better than we can. Then 1 John chapter 2, verse 3. And hereby we do know that we know him, if we keep his commandments. So what? let me stop there a minute. What does it mean then if we don't keep his commandments? <laughs> you know, it's kind of, I think we could look at that both directions. If we say we know him, and then we're going to keep his commandments. If we do not keep his commandments, then the flip side of that stands to reason that we don't really know him. All right, verse 4. He that saith, I know him, and keepeth not his commandments is a liar, and the truth is not in him. But whoso keepeth his word, in him verily is the love of God perfected. Hereby know we that we are in him. And then verse 6. He that abide, saith he abideth in him, ought himself also to walk, even as he walked. <clears throat> All right, in the first group of scriptures that we read, we noticed that Enoch walked with God. Let's see, Noah, Abraham. Did you notice anything special about the second set of scriptures that we looked at? Okay, humbleness. Humility. Humility. I guess the point I'm wanting to notice is that not only did those fellows in the first group of scriptures walk with God, but in the second set of passages, we are to walk with God. It's not just something that these guys in the past did that we can look back and say, wow, they must have been something. And with God, by God's grace, they were. But today, we are to walk with God, all right? We are to walk with God. Someone once said, walking with God isn't an activity reserved for a select few. God desires all of his children to walk with him. I guess that kind of sums up what I was just trying to say. You know, it's not just for a select few back in the Old Testament times or that, but today we are to walk with God. There's another passage of scripture that tells us what's going to happen if we will walk with God, and it's another familiar one from 1 John 1. It says, This then is the message that we have heard of him and declare unto you that God is light, and in him is no darkness at all. If we say that we have fellowship with him and walk in darkness, we lie and do not the truth. But if we walk in the light, there's that word again, walk, if we walk in the light as he is in the light, here are the results. One, 
we have fellowship one with another. And secondly, the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanseth us from all sin. Oh, I like those results. You ever seen anybody point out that illustration about how if two people are walking toward God, if God is up here as a common denominator and two people are walking toward him, do you see what happens? Are we always going to see eye to eye? Absolutely not. But in the grand scheme of things, if we're both walking toward God, toward God he's going to enable us to have fellowship one with another. And the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanseth us from all sin. Okay, so we looked in a general sense about what walking means. Let's look at it a little close, more closely. What does it mean to walk with God? Any ideas? Colton? Follow his footsteps. Follow his footsteps. I like that. That's good. You're, you're getting good answers today, Colton. What happens when we walk with, some, with someone, go on a walk with someone in an earthly sense? Let's think about that for a moment. Imagine that you and a close friend actually have the energy after working to take a walk with a friend out in the country. What happens? Well, generally you're close to each other, right? If you're on a walk with someone, you don't usually, unless they're too fast or something, you generally are in close proximity to one another. Often you talk, laugh, listen, share your hearts. Your attention is focused on the other person, almost to the point of excluding everything else. Say, oh, I did, we were so busy talking, I didn't even notice. You know? Uh, you notice the beauty around you or an occasional, occasional distraction, but even then it might be to share with the other person. Oh, did you just see that? All right. You share it together. You're in harmony. And you both enjoy the peaceful camaraderie. Well, that sounds like a pretty beneficial time, doesn't it? But did you know that's what it is like to walk with God? It's not like something so highly, highly holy and unattainable, but it's, you know, walking as a friend. And that's not to bring him down, but he wants to come and meet us where we are yeah. and lift us up to where he wants us to be. Thank the Lord. Walking with God is like that too. When we enter into an intimate heart relationship with God through faith in his son, he becomes our heart's greatest desire knowing him, hearing his voice, sharing our hearts with him, and seeking to please him, it becomes our all-consuming focus. That's what's involved in walking with God. He becomes everything to us. And meeting with him isn't an activity that's reserved for Sunday morning or Wednesday night, but it becomes <clears throat> to the point where we live to have fellowship with him. I like that. We live to have fellowship with him. A.W. Tozier once said that the goal of every Christian should be to live in a state of unbroken worship. To live in the state of unbroken worship. That sounds like something deeper than just, well, I've been to church for the week, so I did my spiritual duty. But it's living to walk with God day by day and follow in his footsteps like, like Colton said. Let's think about this a little further. When you go walking with a friend, it often requires saying no to a lot of other things, doesn't it? Say, oh, I have so much to do. I've got homework to do. I've got work. I've got wood to cut. I've got... in our, in case of our church, I've either got boxes to pack or unpack, um, load or unload. Um, and so it requires saying no to a lot of other things. And we find that walking with God requires letting go of anything that would be a distraction to us. I guess that reminds me of the thought that was brought out in Sunday school. You know, what steps do we have to take to avoid falling we can't duck our head in the sand and hide away like Joe mentioned. That was a good thought, Joe, you shared with us. 
But there are some times when God will show us, you know, hey, this, this will not be in your best interest to, to follow after this particular train of, you know, action or whatever, because it would be a distraction. Someone once used this example. Let's say, for instance, you were out walking with a friend, and you brought along a kazoo. Does anybody know what a kazoo is, other than my wife who used to play one? Or sometimes I've heard them called like a humazoo, one of those kind of annoying sounding things you put in your mouth and it's got a little thin reed in it and it makes vibration. Well, let's say you were going on a walk with your friend and you brought along a kazoo and you played it the whole time you were with them. James apparently thinks that would be quite annoying. The walk really probably wouldn't be too satisfying for either one of you, would it? And I know that's a really cheesy example, but I think there's a lot of truth to it as well. If we were to try to walk with God and yet harbor, <clears throat> excuse me, harbor, constantly harbor distractions, do you think the walk would really be satisfying to either ourselves or to God? I don't think so. But many people try to claim that they're walking with God, but at the same time, they bring along, we could say, kazoo-like habits of sins, worldly entertainment, uh, wrong relationships, whatever the case might be. And, you know, I think if you want to build a relationship with God, if you don't think it would be conducive to go on a walk with a friend and play a kazoo the whole time, which it wouldn't be, it won't be beneficial to your Christian walk either, your, your desire to walk with God, if you yet try to hang on to all those kazoo-like habits and, and things that would distract us from walking with God. They know these things aren't God's choice for them, but they pretend that everything is fine. To walk with God means that God and us are in agreement about our life. You remember that scripture in Amos 3.3 3 that says, can two walk together except they be agreed? That has a spiritual context as well. To walk with God means that we've aligned our will to his and seek every day to consider ourselves crucified with Christ, as Paul mentioned in, in, his, in the word. Does that mean we're going to be humanly perfect? The key word there being humanly. Absolutely not. If so, I'm sunk. But our heart's desire is to please God. And we're willing to let the Spirit conform us to what he desires for our life. This is all involved in walking with God. When we walk with God every day, then the world can't help but recognize that we've been with God. I guess I think of that story on, on the road to Emmaus. Then those guys, even though they didn't realize at first who they were walking with, didn't they say something like... Uh, did not our hearts burn within us? Like, wasn't there something there? You know, like, I should have known there was something there. Well, people can't help but notice when we walk close to God because it's going to shine forth from our lives. Thank the Lord. I like what one author had to say on this subject. He said, from the beginning, God has wanted a walking partner. God is looking for not only a clinging bride, but a walking partner. God created man for the enjoyment of a walking relationship that involved companionship, dialogue, intimacy, joint decision-making, mutual delight, and shared dominion. God longs to walk with you, which is why his arms of grace have been pulling you into a closer walk with him. Amen. It's not like, well, I hope I can finally on my own, try to get good enough to walk with God. No, God wants to walk with you. Right. He's just longing for you to reach out to him, and he'll be right there helping you to walk day by day with him. I like another thought that was brought out. It said the secret place, you know, like a place of prayer, isn't the destination, it's only the catalyst. You know, people, you might hear people say, well, you need to each day get up and ask God for help for the day, give him thanks and read your word. And those are good things. 
but that's just to help us along in walking each moment of the day with God. It's not like the final destination. Just like church twice a week isn't the final destination. It's just a catalyst to help us walk with God on a daily basis. So what exactly is meant by walking with God? The goal after we're, that we're after is an everyday walk of unbroken communion with our Lord, and not only as our Lord, but our friend. Unbroken communion with our Lord and friend. Who was the first fellow that we noticed walked with God? Enoch, okay. He knew what it was to walk with God. He pressed into God until he learned how to commune with him on a personal basis. Somebody gave the example that they, it wasn't that they were trying to hold Enoch up by using him as an example in the Bible, but it was the fact that God wants us to know that he so enjoys walking with his children is why he used Enoch as an example. And it wasn't to tell us, well, if you ever reach the status that Enoch had, then you can walk with me. But just a reminder that God wants to walk with each one of us. I'm about, about to be done here. There's a little example, a uh, little illustration somebody gave of a little girl that came home from Sunday school one day, and her parents asked her what she learned at, at Sunday school. And she said, well, we talked about Enoch. Oh, you did, her mother asked. What did you learn about him? Well, apparently, the little girl began, Enoch was a man who used to walk with God. God would come by his house every morning and say to him, Enoch, would you like to go for a walk with me today? And Enoch would go with him. Well, I guess this went on and on for a really long time, and every day they would walk a little farther. One day, they walked so far, and it got so late in the day that God told Enoch, Enoch, we really lock, walked a long way today, and it's getting really late. We're a lot closer to my house than yours. Why don't you come home with me? So Enoch went home with God to his house. I like that illustration. Yeah, up there. So what about my walk with the Lord? Am I following him closer each day to his house? Or are we staying too close to ours, so to speak? Am I getting so lost in my walk with God that I lose track of what time it is and how far we've gone? Or am I keeping one eye on the road behind me? And then that brings up another question. The day that he says to us, you know, we've walked so long and so far today. It's getting late. We're closer to my house than yours. Why don't you just go home with me? Will we be glad to do that? Or will we regret it because we've gotten so attached to our home? I know what he meant because he was dying. And yeah. All right. Did you know this also comes with a challenge this morning from John chapter 6? This is the last passage. It says, It is a spirit that quickeneth, the flesh profiteth nothing. The words that I speak unto you, they are spirit and they are life. But there are some of you that believe not, for Jesus knew from the beginning who they were that believed not and who should betray him. And he said, Therefore said I unto you, that no man can come unto me except it were given unto him of my father. Notice verse 66. From that time, many of his disciples went back and walked with him no more. There is that possibility. May God help us to be determined by his grace and help that we're going to continue walking with him. I thought of the words that John Samus once wrote. He said, when we walk with the Lord in the light of his word, what a glory he sheds on our way. While we do his good will, he abides with us still and with all who will trust and obey. When we walk with the Lord in the light of his word, what a glory he sheds on our way. May God help us to walk with him. What does walking mean? It means moving. It means going from point of A to point B. It means a step at a time. But taking a step at a time means we're still walking, doesn't it? 
We're not standing still. We're not backing up, but keeping pressing on, allowing God to conform us to the way he sees is best for us. Let's walk with him. Yep, all right. Now we're going to have our special song. May God bless John and Nikki as they sing.